The Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Chris J from Feathercoin. Hello. Paige Peterson from San Francisco Bitcoin Meetup. Hi there. Megan Lords from Bitcoin Not Bombs. Hello. Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Hola. And Will Pangman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Hey, everybody. Our top story tonight, Yelp lists Bitcoin businesses. Sorry, CoinMap, but there's a new 600-pound gorilla in the room, and that gorilla is Yelp. Yelp, with their billions of businesses and millions of reviews, just added one more checkbox to their website. Do you accept Bitcoin? What does this mean for Bitcoin and business adoption? Chris J. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the uh, works that came off of Andreas's post on, on Reddit, uh, which was used. I believe that Yelp are basically trying to make themselves look a bit cool. I think they've had a lot of controversy in the last few years and they kind of see um, this as an opportunity to make themselves look a little bit trendy and make themselves a bit more relevant. I kind of like the idea, although there was, um, just looking at some of the other artwork as well, there was some kind of pushback because I think people felt as though this was sort of promoting Yelp too much and we could just basically use uh, Bitcoin and not, um, and not have the Yelp logo on there at all. So the idea, the concept was that people from the Bitcoin community would just send a lot of these merchants um, this artwork in a without any return address. And so presumably the merchants would assume that this was coming from Yelp, although obviously if they Google it, they'll find the Reddit post and they'll be foiled. But I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a perfectly um, good enterprise. The only thing is, as I read down some of the comments on, on the Reddit feed and on some of the other blogs, I did notice some merchants sort of commenting that a lot of the customers aren't actually spending Bitcoins. They got into Bitcoins because they were told, and they had this kind of human DDoS effect of people coming in and trying to promote it and telling them to accept Bitcoins, but then they actually don't get anyone using them. So I still think that there's too much speculative sentiment in the market. I think this kind of initiative is fine for PR, but we do need to focus on the values as well. Like we have to actually think about how we're going to change people's behavior so that they don't just hold the Bitcoins to sell out for more dollars later on. Paige Peterson. Yeah, I, I agree with that sentiment about um, not using Bitcoin just as promotion. Um, I did notice that uh, I, I was looking at Yelp and looking at uh, businesses that accepted it and I was trying to search for businesses uh, through their filters option and notice that they didn't have uh, Bitcoin as a filter option. So that's probably the more important feature than saying that they accept it. You would want to be able to search it. So um, that's definitely necessary if they want to um, kind of say that they're actually uh, helping Bitcoin adoption and stuff like that. Uh, I, I see this definitely as a marketing thing for sure. It's not very useful if you can't search for Bitcoin businesses. I'm sure yeah. they'll fix it, though. Megan Lords. Well, I do accept Bitcoin for hula hoops, hula hoop performances, and my uh, articles, of course. I think this is great for Yelp. Yelp is really widely known, um, and it makes it easier on people wanting to find out who takes Bitcoin. You just look it up. Uh, I know that's always a question that I ask myself if I'm wanting to support someone, some business. Um, I'm like, well, do they take Bitcoin because I'm going to be more likely to support them? And for me, that's a part of my activism. Is Oh, seem to have lost Megan. I they no? realize... Did you lose me? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think they realize that they're going to have to be forward-thinking about this. They, they hopefully recognize the utility of the blockchain technology and... I, I hope that other uh, places are able to look to them as an example and kind of catch on and realize that they're going to have to do this to keep up with the times. Christoph, Atlas. I think this is a good, uh, good measure to increase Bitcoin adoption. I think it is important to see more brick-and-mortar adoption in the future. There definitely has been a lag behind brick-and-mortar uh, brick behind the, the e-retailer e stuff because... 
Um, if you are a fan of Bitcoin, you can be anywhere in the world. You can buy something online. And so that's a really easy way to tap into the Bitcoin market. Whereas if you uh, are a brick and mortar, then it's kind of, you know, it's unknown whether you're going to happen to have people that are in your area that are going to be using Bitcoin. Um, where I live, I definitely see quite a bit less of um, the brick and mortar sales of through Bitcoin than I see of uh, the e-retailer stuff. I'm sure there are even places um, who do a lot. They accept both Bic Bitcoin both at their retail stores in brick and mortar and all, also online, and I bet they get a lot more business online. So that's it's going to continue to lag behind as long as um, you know Bitcoin is still at the early adopter stage. Will Pangman. So I think this is really great. For oh, seems like it might be system. muted. Um, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? It was working a minute ago. Have we lost a connection? Are you there? Can you guys hear me? I don't know what to do. We've hit a silent part of the show. Um, maybe unplug it and replug it in. Try it again. I don't know. Something's happened. But um, let's come back to Will. Yeah, we'll come back to him. Maybe try signing off, signing back on. Um, moving on. Exit question. Now that Yelp highlights Bitcoin businesses, which online company will adopt Bitcoin next? Groupon, Living Social, which is of course owned by Amazon. Chris, Jay. Um, I'm not too bothered about this. The science is wearing a bit thin now because lots of companies are just using the Bitcoin um, you know, name as a way of piggybacking off it to get some free marketing and advertising because they know that all the Bitcoin shills out there will start you know, tweeting the, the, the links. Um, I don't mean to sound so dour and cynical. It's just that I think that, that Bitcoin is more relevant to local merchants and it's more relevant to the small businesses because they're the ones that are penalized by all the credit card fees. A lot of these larger merchants have got plenty of uh, controlling interest in the contracts with the banks as it, as it is. So I think we'd be, I'm more interested to see it get into local businesses and I'm also interested to see um, if we can actually display any of the data like what, how much is a loaf of bread worth in Bitcoin and actually have that be comparative across the world so that Bitcoin doesn't constantly float against the dollar, but actually floats against a range of commodities. I think that would be helpful for all cryptocurrencies, actually. So people can start to get, like, psychologically, uh, just a sense of how much a gallon of, of petrol costs in Bitcoin, for example, and they can start to anchor themselves psychologically to those price points. Paige Peterson. Um, well, I guess the biggest competitor, you could say, to Yelp uh, searching for businesses, local businesses at least, is almost Google Maps. So if Google Maps were to add a little icon to accept Bitcoin, that would be cool. Um, I don't necessarily see them uh, doing that, but it might be a good incentive for them to start thinking about uh, making their maps a little, uh, have a higher edge than the other competitors. Megan Lords. Maybe other places, uh, other review sites like Urban Spoon or something like that. Um, but again, and this is something that I say pretty frequently on the show, I really want to see smaller businesses taking on Bitcoin. I, I really think that those are the people that need it the most and that it would be the most valuable to. So I think while it's always good news more, that more online retailers are taking Bitcoin, you're not going to grow it until you're growing it on the, you know, locally in your local economy. So I, I kind of echoing what Chris J is saying on this. I really want to see it um, taken on by smaller local businesses, and that involves work. That involves us getting out there and doing what we can to get people involved. Christoph Atlas. I'm generally more interested in the the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, so I'd like to see something like maybe Craigslist, where you can um, differentiate your Craigslist ads by accepting cryptocurrency. That's a great idea, and just like Yelp, Craigslist could add it just by editing their code and adding another checkbox. It doesn't really cost them anything beyond the initial setup charge. Will, any luck on your sound? What do you think? Can you guys hear me? No, it still looks like a silent movie from Wisconsin. Let's see, can he pantomime? Is he in favor of Amazon? We'll just have to move on for now, but good luck fixing your sound. Moving on to issue two. Issue two, 
MIT to give every student $100 in Bitcoin. What will they do? Will they spend it, save it, invest it, or just give it away to friends? Could this $100 inspire the Bitcoin entrepreneurs of the future? Or will they just spend it on an Amazon gift card from Gift? Paige Peterson. Um, well, I hope that they uh, use it for sort of a local economy of sorts. I know that MIT does a, uh, I believe it's a monthly flea market. That would be cool to sort of incentivize uh, use of Bitcoin. Um, and... Um, yeah, just, I guess, using it in between uh, exchanging for materials when you're uh, at um, a campus that uses a lot of hardware and stuff for, for building projects and working on things, um, being able to exchange um, between students using Bitcoin is a good way to make use of that. It would be great for class projects. Megan Lords. I think this is great because this is going to show the interactive capabilities of Bitcoin and it's really going to show how easy it is to use, especially for younger people. That's who I want to see get involved in it the most too, is younger people who are college age. I think that if given $100 uh, immediately, they, they, would, they may spend it. I know uh, when I was in college, money was very hard to come by and any time I would have some of it, I would be spending it on things I needed, of course, uh, stuff like that. Um, I was working and supporting myself and man, I wish uh, I wish they were doing this years ago and could have given me $100 in Bitcoin. That would be great. But I really hope that they hold on to some of it, um, maybe invest it, but also use some of it to demonstrate how easy it is for people to use. And I think the more you have people hands-on using it, the, more, the better it is going to be uh, to, to kind of grow it and spread the word about it. So I think this is a great idea. This is an excellent idea for an experiment to kind of really show the real value Bitcoin has. Ah, Christoph Atlas. I was muted that time. Um, I think uh, I think this is great. I'm impressed by MIT um, taking this step. Um, I'm seeing more and more interest in Bitcoin from universities, and not just from the students, but also uh, faculty members, people working for the university, uh, which is surprising um, because there are so many reasons for people that work for universities not to be fans of Bitcoin. Uh, it's still the case that a lot of the money that people make uh, working in academia ends up coming from the government one way or another, either through, you know, if it's a public university or through uh, loans and so forth, um, which, you know, Bitcoin is definitely going to disrupt all of that. So, yeah, I, th I think it's great that they're doing this. And, you know, there's a lot of very, very smart, clever, creative people at MIT. And so it's a fantastic crowd to be the first, you know, university to have complete a saturation of Bitcoin amongst the student body. I think it's a great idea. I'm just disappointed they didn't do it a few years ago. They really could have inspired some people early into the Bitcoin movement and also given them that, you know, multiplier money. This could have uh, paid off somebody's college loans. It could have paid for somebody's brand new business. And maybe it still can in the future. We still can't hear from Will. Can you hear me, guys? Now it works. Works fine. Hey, great. Um, so I've, I have some cool things I want to share uh, about the MIT project. I, I've been in touch with um, Dan Elitzer, who's one of the organizers of the MIT Bitcoin Club and, and that stuff. I want to talk about that, but I want to answer the last question because I think it could, you know, with Yelp and Bitcoin, you know, putting those stickers on the doors of Bitcoin accepting merchants who, you know, are already listed on Yelp, you know, people look at those stickers. They look at Zagat reviews. They look at whether business is on Facebook or Twitter and, and Yelp and, and a Bitcoin sticker right there, too. Um, people pay attention to that, so that's a good way. Oh, they're familiar with Yelp and the brand, and then they see Bitcoin on the same sticker, and they may check it out if they haven't heard of it, or they'll um, give it more credibility, right? Um, so that's, that's important, but one of the best, like, outreach or activism things that we've done in Milwaukee is we post uh, Yelp reviews on businesses, you know, um, around around the Milwaukee area who we want to accept Bitcoin, you know, like five or seven or ten of us will go over the course of two days or something and leave reviews or comments on um, Merchant's Yelp page saying, hey, your stuff was great, we love this, 
you should accept Bitcoin. I'd really like to pay in Bitcoin, things like that. So um, this just, you know, makes that uh, um, have more credibility and another easy, easy in. The other thing that I think would be cool is um, to use change tip and Yelp in the same uh, in the same approach, right? So reaching out to these merchants who hopefully probably also have a Twitter account or you know any social media account and tipping them in Bitcoin with change tip, leaving them a Yelp message saying, "Hey, I sent you. I was the one who sent you that Bitcoin tip. I want you to accept Bitcoin." I mean, it just it balloons, right? And so um, Yelp allowing this as a feature, it needs to be filterable setting. Yeah, you know, you need a filter so you can search through the Bitcoin, you know, accepting businesses in any given place. That would be nice. But um, you can kind of get around that in the time being by combining some of these awesome new startups like Change Tip and, you know, getting your meetup group involved. Um, so that's, that's all really cool to me. I think that's awesome. Um, the MIT... Uh, project it, I think is just just great. There's going to be a lot of colleges that we hear about. Um, it's probably in the fall semester because the the spring semester is here winding to an end. But uh, we're going to hear about a lot of colleges springing up with Bitcoin groups doing massive um, projects like this one, and uh, you know even getting their colleges to accept Bitcoin for tuition, to accept Bitcoin uh, um, donations for their alumni associations. You can, you can expect that that one will come through from some major universities. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but, um, yeah, so this is really exciting stuff. I mean, we talked a little bit on the uh, Bitcoin talk show earlier this week about the kinds of ideas, experiments you could run. That's, that's a fun discussion um, that Thomas and I had, and, and, you know, maybe there's some more panelists who want to comment on that. But uh, Dan Elitzer is the one of the organizers of the... MIT Bitcoin project, which is, you know, they independently raised half a million dollars to give to all those undergrads, and that's somewhat uh, apart from the actual MIT Bitcoin club, even though the same people are involved, um, the money was like privately raised, but the MIT Bitcoin club is going to be impartially involved in the disbursement and the education and um, just like enriching the ecosystem, you know, so all those undergrads have a home and have a place where they can go for information and so on. So that's going to be really neat. The other thing I wanted to mention is this weekend they're having a mini conference on Saturday and it's, um, it's going to be live streamed. So we'll, we'll tweet that link out. I, I'll tweet it and Tom will retweet it. So if you're following Milwaukee or Matt, uh, Matt Bitcoins or the Bitcoin group or Bitcoin MKE, um, check those feeds for, check those timelines for a link to the live streaming of the mini conference. They have some really great speakers. Uh, the CTO of Circle is speaking. Gavin Andreessen is speaking. Uh, and there's a couple others who are going to talk about um, the university education project um, that I'm working on with several students around the country to start playing Johnny Appleseed for Bitcoin student groups all over North America and actually outside of North America. We already have some interest too. So keep an eye out for that stuff. More of this uh, Bitcoin popping up on college campuses is coming, so um, let's do what we can as a community to support these fun projects, and um, yeah, so keep an eye out on the Twitter feed for the live stream link for those talks. It'll be a really neat little mini conference. I guess they have 700 registrants for this mini conference on Saturday, 700, and it's free, which is awesome, so. 700, that would be twice Dogecon. And it would be really interesting, Will, if the MIT Alumni Association got a large deal or a large donation of Bitcoin from the students. That would be fascinating. I think it's a good idea to uh, use Yelp as an organizing tool to talk to Bitcoin businesses because, yeah, they will talk to you through Yelp. It's a good idea. Chris J., any thoughts on MIT and Bitcoin? Yeah. Yeah, hopefully this will inspire some, some of the smartest minds in the world to actually start building on top of the blockchain technology. I think it is a little bit late because I think that the Bitcoin is already very popular. Um, actually, Fred Wilson talks about this on his blog, abc.com. Um, it's a post called the Pied Piper Effect. I guess if you just Google that, it'll come up, the Pied Piper Effect. And a few people sort of mentioned, I think one person mentioned, like, well, Bully, will students be bullied for their bitcoins in the playground in the future? You know, Andreas has talked about this a lot recently at conferences about you know Tommy Coin, you know, and kids having their own cryptocurrencies and it being a form of uh, barter in the in the in the playground. I think that young people are the perfect 
um, way to get this adopted because then you're actually disrupting a lot of these uh, incumbent institutions from the knees down, right? Like you're cutting them off at the roots because they thrive on this kind of factory fodder of students that come out of university and they give up on their dreams and they just sell out for the government job because you know it's a nice safe paycheck. So I think that by inspiring these young people into this um, revolutionary technology, I think that that can only be a good thing. Exit question. If you were a college student given $100 in Bitcoin, what would you do with it? Paige Peterson. Um, I would probably use it to pay another student for um, writing a paper or helping me move with something. Try to keep it in uh, the family, so to say. <laughs> Megan Lord. So I dropped out of college, um, but if I were back in college and I got $100 in Bitcoin and knew what it was, I'm really stingy. I would probably hold on to it for a while. I can't really think of anything I need right now either. So, um, yeah, I, I might just hold on to it until uh, something comes up that I need to use it for. So I, that's a terrible answer, but I can't really think of anything I need right now. So I would just hold on to it. Atlas. Um, I'd buy another 100 back bucks of Bitcoin, use the first hundred in the you know, local MIT economy. I think that could be a really fun uh, tradition at MIT to be uh, bartering with other students with their their shared pool of Bitcoins. And uh, I'd keep the other hundred and hold on to it with my cold, my cold dead hands uh, until it, the price goes up. Will Pangman. Well, I'll tell you what I wouldn't do with it. I'm not going to give it to any enterprising Harvard students who try to scoop up all the MIT Bitcoins. Chris uh, Ellis. I would probably try something technical with it. So I might send it to a P2SH uh, address, which allows for multi-signature. I'd maybe try doing something along the lines of voting, so maybe give every student one Satoshi so they can vote on something. Yeah, I'd try something interesting and technical like that. Like, after all, it is like a computer engineering university like that's that's what it's known for it might not be the best investment strategy but if I could get two tacos for a dollar I could get 200 tacos for a hundred dollars just saying issue three dark wallet nears release transfer your bitcoins anonymously with dark wallet even if you don't want to send your bitcoins you can anonymize them and send them back to yourself could dark wallets solve Bitcoin's anonymity problem? Megan Lords. Well, I certainly hope so. This is really promising technology, and I know some people are already in the process of testing it. I'm not one of those people, so I, I'm kind of the type. Uh, I like to wait and see what happens and see uh, see it being used practically uh, and, and, you know, really see the application of it before I'll really believe it. So, I, like I said, it has a lot of promise, and I really hope it can. Christoph, Atlas. I think this story has two types of significance. One is the actual software, which is um, it's very promising. Um, I think that perhaps the May 1st release date was a bit premature. I've been playing around with it. and It's uh, quite buggy, but you know it's, it's still an alpha uh, stage. Um, but aside from the actual software, there's also the, the proof of concept. And, and Dark Wallet proves several things. First of all, it proves that there is a group of people out there, a body of people who can put this type of stuff together, that have the, the programming savvy, the cryptographic savvy. We had collaboration between uh, Amir Taki and Peter Todd uh, doing the programming and some of the computer science background, respectively. We've got the people that can reach out to the community and uh, touch them and, and let them know how important these projects are with people like Cody Wilson. And so, and we've got a whole group of people out there that are willing to crowdfund these kind of efforts and put up a not insignificant amount of money to help uh, people put these kind of things together. And that's very promising. And what it tells us is that there's a lot of people that care a lot about a free economy, that want to see humanity set more free than it currently is, that they, they see the potential of Bitcoin to accomplish this task and they're willing to actually you know, put down some of their hard-earned cash and their time 
and passion into a project like this. And so that is fantastic to see. I'm really, really excited to see it. And you have to love and admire the style of people like uh, Amir and Cody who have you know the, the awesome logo and these uh, hilarious videos where they're holding up 3D printed guns. And it's, um, it's, all, it's all really good. And I quite agree with them, which is, uh, you know the overall sentiment about dark market. Let there be dark. It's it's that we live in a world now where we it, it's it's a bizarre world where we have to equate darkness with freedom, because we live in a world that is so unfree. We have to you know flip the script and that which becomes subversive, disruptive, uh, antagonistic. It, in so many areas of our life, that can be annoying. It can be frustrating. It can be, you know, lead to to losses. But in in economics, it is the you know this this the source of freedom for humanity right now. Will Pangman. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with everything Christoph pointed out. Um, it was really well said, man. Uh, I guess what I'm interested in about this is the the tact that they're taking in promoting their product. I think it's like incredibly cur cur courageous and there's like so much hubris about it but um, like almost more than I don't know it's it's one thing to like show up on the playground and 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 stir things up it's another to like you know challenge the teacher who just broke up the playground fight to a fight, you know what I mean? Which is kind of like the tack they're taking and it's really just, I don't know, amazing to watch um, from, the, from the public relations side of things. Uh, we did a demonstration of Dark Wallet at our meetup last night um, and it, Christoph said it is a little bit buggy. Uh, everyone marveled at what Christoph also pointed out were, were proofs of concepts and really exciting things to come for the beta versions and, and the ultimate, you know, official 1.0 release and stuff. So people are going to use this stuff. The fact that Bitcoin is capable of this um, means that something should be developed around around it in this way. And Dark Wallet and you know, uh, Open Bazaar or Dark Market fulfill that. And there's many others out there that do the same. Uh, again, it, it, this is a total cat and mouse game. I think one of the main problems that all of us de uh, dedicated Bitcoiners have experienced over the last like maybe six months is the like slow trudge through the mud in the wake of this China stuff. Uh, the whole space seems to just be kind of in a lull and um, like a calm before the calm, you know, more calm to come, you know. It just doesn't, uh, I don't think anyone, everyone believes I think, um, the diehards that is, that we're going to have a, a huge, another huge run-up um, in, in attention, in adoption, in price, and all that stuff. Um, but uh, I don't think we know that it's coming right around the corner. It might be several corners down the road. But um, st stuff like this prove that, like, you know, development's going on with or without uh, the Bitcoin Foundation elections, with or without VC money, with or without uh, regulation, and and. Again, all that stuff is slowing things down. Like nobody, nobody on the outside of Bitcoin is is really tenaciously willing to jump in until a lot of those three things I just mentioned are clarified more, um, or or give them more confidence or, or whatever you know appeal to their sensibilities some more. And Cody, Amir, and the Unsystem crew and Dark Market, Dark Wallet, they're all just saying, you know, f it, we're gonna just keep going, and people are gonna keep using this stuff and. Again, the cat and mouse game is is fun to watch for someone like me who I can't code, so I can't like have a hand in crafting these things. But they're so far ahead of any regulatory regime, and I don't think there's any way any agency, state, group, organization, whatever could catch up. Just no way. So um, you know, I don't know. I kind of think the debate that's going on between the pro-regulation crowd or the regulation cheerleader crowd, whatever, and the, you know, anarcho, crypto-anarchist, crypto-libertarian crowd is just um, a distraction among, among the Bitcoin community as well as it is a distraction for the regulators and for uh, the bigger corporations that might adopt Bitcoin. It's all a distraction while what really goes on is permissionless innovation, 
uh, with, with technologies that are going to bring freedom to people. I mean, the freedom to move money around is what Bitcoin provides, and the freedom to do that without heavy surveillance, which the blockchain technically can be capable of, is important too. And let's build that on top. Let's build anything we want on top of this, and the people who want to use those, those products will use them um, probably with impunity. And that's great. Chris, Jay. Yeah, I agree with what Christoph said. And also, I would say that, that Bitcoin doesn't have an anonymity problem. The whole point is that it gives you the full spectrum of traceability if you want it or anonymity if, if you want it. So this is, I, I think, is a very welcome add to that spectrum. You should definitely also check out this famous book, um, or certainly within this this uh, industry anyway, um, with Crypto Anarchy, Cyber States, and Pirate Utopias. It was kind of a, a revolutionary book um, in its day, and it's, off, it's where Cody gets a lot of his philosophy from. I would actually just like to speak briefly, because nobody did really talk much about Cody Wilson whom I'm kind of, you know, I, I really just love the guy. I think he's fascinating. I had the pleasure of meeting him in London once. Um, he, he talks like a sort of French uh, intellectual, you know, he's always quoting, uh, you know, Foucault or Deleuze. But if you really want to get behind his philosophy, I mean, put his ego to one side. He, he's almost kind of uh, self-deprecating, and I don't mind that he has this kind of ego on him. If you really want to get to know what he believes in, uh, where he st talks about this idea of uh, independent asymmetric warfare, or this sort of virtue terrorism where everyone is going to have their own sovereignty and nothing is going to stop it. So everyone's going to be waging war on each other. Anyway, he really goes to town on it in this uh, interview that he did um, at uh, the University of Texas and somebody recorded it. It's in two parts. If you want to get to know more about where he's going, I think in the future we're probably going to see more projects like this come out of Unsystem Crew. And so yeah, I think it's a, a very welcome introduction. Paige Peterson. Yeah, just to reiterate how uh, important new kinds of technologies are like this to give people uh, just as much of an option to be anonymous or more anonymous than they have to be transparent. Like, there's benefits of having both, and I think equaling out um, bo equaling out the the, um, the scale and making it easy to to reach on either side is really important. So um, this is definitely a step in the right direction. I haven't tried using it yet, but I look forward to um, once it's uh, a little less buggy. Exit question. Will you anonymize your Bitcoins with Dark Wallet? Megan Lords. I'm no constitutionalist, but I plead the fifth. Christoph Atlas. Um, of course, I would never publicly uh, anonymize my Bitcoins. Um, I have no interest in money laundering. No. Look, uh, people are going to use Dark Wallet. And fundamentally, they're going to be using it for the exact opposite reason that people are going to be damning it. They're using it for consumer protection. We're trying to protect consumers from the regulators. The regulators are not there for the protection of consumers. That's what we're there for. Um, so yeah, a dark wallet's great. Um, as it gets more advanced, it will be uh, even more powerful and fully fulfilled. Um, element of our toolkit for achieving financial privacy. Um, I'm doing a tutorial series on uh, the World Crypto Network. I've already started that. I've got a little tutorial up just to get you started in installing it and whatnot and playing with it. So uh, keep posted to the uh, to the World Crypto Network if you would like to get a little bit of help with figuring out how, exactly how to use Dark Wallet. Will Pangman. Yeah, I'd just like to encourage anyone who's interested in trying this to follow Christoph's series. You know, Christoph has an incredible way of making this stuff simple for people. And um, the book as well, Anonymous Bitcoin book, is a fantastic manual. So please check that stuff out if you're interested in your, in your privacy with Bitcoins and privacy online in general. Uh, I will use Dark Wallet. I like to use all of these relatively prominent softwares that are coming out. I want to know about them so I can t tell people about them talk intelligently about them from experience, so I will be using it for, for those reasons, among others, probably. You know, Cody Wilson comes out right out and says, oh, what is Dark Wallet? It's money laundering software. You know, he doesn't need to say that, but he's, he's making a point. And, um, again, that term is, for, for better or for worse, you know, uh, not a term that the people in, in the public, in the body politic, came up with, or, or use around each other. You know, that's, um, that's not where it originates, right? So 
what's what's really going on? The only thing I the only issue I had was that it's so brazen. But again, I see his I see his strategy. I like the courage and the brazenness. It's it's awesome to see. It's inspiring for so many people. So that's important too. Um, but it's not money laundering software. It's privacy software. You know, I mean, it's it's a software that can give you options to achieve the levels of privacy, freedom, um, all that stuff that you in security too. You know, long term security. If you so choose, you know there are many reasons why you forego those things. Some good, some bad. But let's let's like take back the language. I think I like Cody antagonizing the language. That's that's really great, you know, marketing. It really is. But um, but I want to take back the language. I'm not going to call this money laundering software. That's not what people are going to use it for. They're going to use it for privacy, as Christoph mentioned. Money laundering is a bullshit term. It's like terrorism. Uh, so, you know, 9-11, oh, it was an act of terrorism, 6,000 people died, which was incredibly tragic, but then the United States uh, government, which are the worst terrorists in the world, then invaded a country which led to the death of one million people. Money laundering is like that. Uh, if there's drug cartels that can get on the good side of the banks and the banks get on the good side of the regulators, then millions of dollars get, uh, you know, filtered through banks for violent drug cartels. Uh, meanwhile, Charlie Shrem is still, you know, hanging out at his house for possibly maybe uh, funneling some bitcoins in the the general direction of a guy that may have bought some drugs or a T-shirt from Silk Road. So, you know, if you want to find a good, if you really want to understand what money laundering is, I very much recommend the works of John Matanis. He has an article uh, called uh, "Money Laundering Is Financial Thought Crime." And uh, I definitely think that taking a second look at that terminology, it, like Will said, is very well worth your effort. Chris, Jay. I believe it was actually 3,000 people that died in 9-11, and an unprecedented number died in the wars following, like orders of magnitude more. Um, right, so I, one of my dreams and ambitions as a kid was to set up like a local drug gang and become like one of these kind of lords, and I was waiting, I was just waiting for an anonymous online currency to come along that would just let me do that. So I can't wait to start using this and getting some kids on the street corners, you know, and getting some drive-by arguments. I live in a very posh part of England, so I will be mostly engaging in dialectic rather than bullets, but yeah, I can't wait to use it, it's great. Paige Peterson. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely be using it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh oh, no, no hedging there. Moving on to issue four. Ohio bans Bitcoin for buying booze. Bitcoin Boulevard in Cleveland sounded like a really cool idea. A block full of businesses who have banded together to take Bitcoin. You could walk up and down the street full of bars and restaurants and never have to pay a single red cent. You could just pay in Bitcoin. But don't worry, Clevelanders. You can't have nice things. Much like the Baltimore Ravens who left town to win two Super Bowls, the Ohio Department of Public Safety is on the scene saying that Bitcoin is too volatile to be a currency, and therefore you can't buy booze. Does this make any sense, or are they just trying to stomp innovation out of the Buckeye State? Kristoff, Atlas. You know, alcohol is one of those funny things. It differs from county to county, state to state. You um, you drive around a little bit, and you're bound to cross half a dozen different imaginary lines where, um, you know, there's, oh, I can buy booze in this place. Well, I just passed by a bunch of beer places in this one town, but then in this town there are no beer places. Are they all, they're all state liquor stores. Why? I, what's going on here? Oh, the state liquor store closes at 4 p.m. on Friday because that's like a magical, you know, time. Uh, so I'm not surprised to see that this is coming up in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a tricky topic for regulators. It's confusing. It's very futuristic and and uh, complicated in cryptography and anonymity and um, and so you know and you know you know frankly you can tell that the people that are involved with regulating liquor are some of the dumbest people to get into the regulation scene. Um, so I'm not surprised that it, to hear that they're having trouble with that. I expect to see more you know complications related to this in other states. And you know meanwhile in Europe you'll be able to buy a, a you know 20 ounce of uh, beer with Bitcoin and you'll have no problem. Absolutely and. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. You wouldn't have to figure out the cryptography while you were drunk to pay, would you? That's not part of this, is it? Will, your thoughts? 
What we have here is a failure to communicate. Uh, this is disheartening. You know, I we can't get uh, education. We can't get our hands around the narrative quickly enough. I know what we're doing with the show and other shows on the World Crypto Network and other media outlets in the Bitcoin space and other advocates everywhere growing like you know in exponentially are trying to do this and, and relatively on an island and, and um, you know there's there's common themes that run throughout but there's no reason why someone in and around Cleveland shouldn't have gone to some public hearings or something or written some emails some snail mail letters something to um, try and wedge their foot in the door here and get involved in the discussion and again if they still want to come out with a guidance like this because legally they feel compelled or whatever great but at least they have a little more wherewithal uh, this is total just uh, I don't I don't know what it could be motivated by except the typical stuff we've seen with with businesses and regulators like nothing nothing related to Bitcoin is illegal but uh, you know except the crimes that are already on the books with just regular human behavior and if Bitcoin is involved then maybe you can lump it in there but you know there's no, there's no uh, reason any business should be afraid of taking Bitcoin. There's no reason uh, that any person should be wary of getting involved in Bitcoin just from an investment of time or attention standpoint. I'm not talking about actually owning the currency or whatever or investing in anything in the space. Just time and energy, time and attention. Uh, it's, uh, it's appalling. I wish... Um, I, I suspect, I know there's an active meetup community in Cleveland, I know some of them, I, I suspect some of them probably tried to communicate either before or after the fact with, uh, with this bureaucracy. And again, it'll be something I think in a few months, hopefully, or maybe a few years time, will be looked at, back at as very foolish. So we're, you know, there's, an, there's stories all, all around about, um, I think uh, there was... Um, Trade Hill has had like four or five incarnations, all of which have been co compliant. And the most recent one, they had a, a credit union, a, re a relationship with a credit union to supply their business. And because Trade Hill is for like um, wealthy investors getting into Bitcoin, essentially, uh, they regulators, some bureaucracy contacted the the credit union and essentially scared them into canceling the account with Trade Hill. And so Trade Hill is you know again having to reincarnate again so this none of this stuff happens because bitcoin's illegal or risky it happens because people in positions of authority or power are influencing and scaring um, other institutions that have an impact on these businesses so that's really unfortunate i like the uh, specificity of the ruling if i want to buy a burger that's fine but if I want a beer to go with my burger, no way, it's too complicated, it's too confusing, too volatile. Chris J, your thoughts. Is it too volatile for me to buy a beer to go with my burger? This article is a massive troll. I don't even want to get involved. But I will say that BitPay makes this entirely irrelevant because as soon as you pay with BitPay, it goes through to US dollars. And if anyone remembers the US prohibition laws between 1920 and 1933, I think, and then Mississippi later in 1966, yes, it's a joke. <laughs> Paige Peterson, your thoughts. So from what I've read about this uh, this topic, it seems like the guy that was starting Bitcoin Boulevard was sort of like asking for permission to use Bitcoin, which I think that was his first problem. He should have just done it and like been prepared like to sell other things because obviously if they're going to make Bitcoin illegal to buy anything, that's going to be a huge problem and they probably wouldn't go that far. Um, I, I Yeah, I definitely think that um, he should have just done it in the first place and maybe he should still keep doing it and yeah look forward to technology that's gonna subvert this in any way so good luck the state. <laughs> so this was very revealing it revealed a few things uh, first off I think a lot of us realize that alcohol is highly regulated in this country I mean it, it, it goes county by county it's very strange laws very very old laws, but uh, it reveals the kind of 
ignorant nature of the people trying to regulate Bitcoin. They don't really understand it, uh, and, and they think that they can regulate it like booze. They think that they can be very draconian with these regulations and try to prevent you from using it for certain things, and then they give you these real kind of bullshit reasons that they, I don't even think, have really even thought through. But it's kind of good news because what it reveals to the people is the people above you are usually your inferiors or, you know, maybe the same intelligence level as you. These are not intelligent people. You're not being ruled by these compassionate, thoughtful, insightful people that people assume you are when, you know, you have a government structure. So it's kind of interesting. It really kind of reveals their ignorance and how they're still trying to hold on to that little bit of control they can exert through regulating things like alcohol, which shouldn't even be a contentious issue at all. Uh, but for some reason still is. So basically, uh, I, I want to, I guess, offer people, if you're down in the Pensacola area, I'll buy you a beer with Bitcoin at the Magnolia, and uh, you don't have to worry about Cleveland. I, I think this is really just kind of showing the uh, kind of grasping at straws over these last few little things that they still have control over. But the more they kind of try to suppress something, the more it's shown their ignorance of it and how... They really can't. They, you cannot stop this innovative technology no matter how much you try to crack down on it. Banning Bitcoin is a very innovative move to come out of Ohio. I'm sure a lot of programmers are thinking of moving there, a lot of high-tech firms, a lot of companies. I'm sure a lot of money is being transferred into the state of Ohio because of this incredibly wise decision. Exit question. Will Ohio change their mind? Or is Bitcoin Boulevard doomed? Christoph Atlas. Yeah, as you pointed out, they'll probably feel the pressure from the entrepreneurs and the, the people that actually um, generate the wealth that pay their damn paychecks. And uh, they'll, they'll turn their decision around, at least in the, uh, the short term. It seems week after week of people buying burgers with no problem should lead people to naturally believe you could buy a beer to go with that burger as well. It's not going to destroy the check. Will Pangman. So uh, I'll just call on any other Midwest meetup groups or any meetup group in any city in America to create a Bitcoin boulevard in your town and then publicize it in Cleveland-based publications. You know, email a letter to, um, uh, oh, they have a weird name for their paper. I forget the weird name. They have a very weird name for their... The Plains the, Dealer? The Plains Dealer, yes. Yeah, email the Plains Dealer. And, you know, other, um, other examples of this in other American cities can go a long way to just show the foolishness and just really just confusion. Or I don't know. It's, it's sad. It's a really sad... It, it's very trolly, as, as Chris pointed out. Again, poor Cleveland. They're a great idea, and the only thing we can do is give it to the rest of the world and tell them to give it a shot. Chris J., is it doomed? BitPay. <laughs> BitPay. That's all they need. Paige. Uh, yeah, do it anyway. They all, they're not banning, like, selling, uh, s selling anything else for Bitcoin. So, yes, like, open a bar that has mostly beer and then sell, like, french fries or, you know, snacks to go along with it to show how ridiculous it is that you can accept Bitcoin for those things but not the beer. Make it, like, super out there and obvious for them. I'm told that now all packs of french fries come with a free beer. It's a great deal. Megan Lords. The facade is falling apart, and they're going to have to change their mind on this if they want to keep up. You can only try to uh, suppress an economy for, for so long. And small business owners are incredibly adaptive and good at finding loopholes to these things. These regulators, again, are not as smart as you think, as some people think they are. So I'm curious to see, uh, like Paige said, some of the loopholes that are going to be employed by these business owners. You know, they, they don't call it the Silicon Valley of the Midwest for nothing. Moving on, issue five, Wisconsin financial regulators warn about the dangers of Bitcoin. Attention all Wisconsin residents, be aware of Bitcoin and virtual currencies. I'm just going to stop there. Awareness is important. Will Pangman, what do you think about Wisconsin warning people and telling them they should be aware of Bitcoin? 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I can't tell if it's a warning or uh, an awareness public uh, uh, service announcement. They might have to so, be aware of the English language. Could they, maybe. I, I, I like awareness, like you pointed out. It's, let's see more of that. I mean, the, um, there's an article on coinbuzz.com, and they kind of uh, go through what, you know, there's some quotes here, like, the value of virtual currencies is highly volatile and the concept behind the currency is difficult to understand even for sophisticated financial experts. Investors should be aware that investments that incorporate virtual currency present very real risks. I don't know of any investments that don't present real risks. I certainly know of lots of toxic investments we've been uh, predatorily sold into, uh, or our children, or our children's children even, if you want to go that far. There's just tons of stuff in this um, in this guidance that is so ridiculous. Uh, there's another little statement here that, um, you know, they warn that each investor must handle their own security because virtual currency is not backed by any government and numerous exchanges and wallets have been breached which result in thefts and losses. And while that's all true, and I don't think there's I mean, you can infer some spin there, but yeah, you, each investor needs to handle their own security. So for once, the government is saying, you're on your own, which I think we should thank them for? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll put a link again on Twitter, and maybe Tom will retweet it, others, and you guys can read this if you haven't already. It's in my news feed early, from earlier today. Um, I don't want to steal everyone else's thunder, but there's just so much in here worth destroying and picking apart. Just, um, I don't think it's going to have any impact. I mean, in Madison, just this week, we in uh, the Madison Meetup Group, which, which I have some, some direct involvement in, um, announced a crowdfunded craft brewery that now accepts Bitcoin. So you can vote on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and other places for the recipes you'd like them to brew and then show up at their beer tastings and the more popular ones will get um, brewed on a mass scale. They now accept Bitcoin. I think they're called Mobcraft. So I'm not sure of the website, but if you Google Mobcraft, which I think is an awesome name, um, there's other uh, businesses in Madison that are popping up accepting Bitcoin just besides Mobcraft. So Madison and Wisconsin as a whole, I mean, Milwaukee, we have uh, another new business accepting Bitcoin called Hotel Foster. It's not a hotel but it's a nightclub. It's really great. We had Jeffrey Tucker speak in person this past Monday there. They accept Bitcoin now. And there's an actual hotel. Um, it's, a, it's a Days Inn, but they, the, title, the name of the business is Hotel of the Arts. It's right near the uh, theater district in Milwaukee. And they accept Bitcoin. So again, you know, Cleveland, take notice. Or any other you know, state government bureaucra bureaucracies, take notice. Um, I think people are handling themselves just fine without your awareness PSAs. It's certainly an important awareness warning because no banks have ever been robbed. No one's ever lost their money in a bank or in a stock market or in a housing market. That's never happened. Chris J, should all of Wisconsin be worried about Bitcoin? No, you should take a leaf out of what we're doing in the UK and actually go to these local regions and teach them about it. That's how we got whole city council involved. Like, you've got to preempt this this strike. I, I just quickly had a look over that article. It looks like another troll. looks like the journalist didn't really know what he was talking about as well, which didn't help. Um, so it's just more of the same. Um, so I think you've got to go to the local communities and you've actually... I was down in Brixton the other day. Um, we've got some more meetings down there because Brixton in the UK already has its local currency called Brixton Pound, although it is centralized. And of course, one of the benefits of having an open source and distributed ledger like like Bitcoins is that you don't have to pay ongoing engineering costs. A lot of those will be taken care, care of for you. Paige Peterson. Yeah, uh, I agree. I, I don't, I'm not too worried, I think. It'll be okay. All, all we'll have to do is stay out of Wisconsin, right? It's, it's going to be really tough. Yeah, I guess if, uh, I mean, unless, if the businesses listen, I mean, they could just not listen, and then we could all still go to Wisconsin, and that would be cool. <laughs> Merry the Lords. It's like, no offense, but Wisconsin is kind of one of those places, like, I, I kind of forget exists. Like, I don't really, I, I know that sounds terrible, but I, I'm just really not worried about this at all. Um, 
the wording was really strange in that article. I, I thought that was kind of uh, hilarious. Uh, I think maybe the author meant to write beware of Bitcoin, but uh, but yes, we should definitely be very aware of it. Um, but I really didn't see anything new uh, that people who already use Bitcoin don't already know. Uh, yeah, just... Yeah, I don't take it very seriously. I'm glad they're working on an awareness campaign because I hear they have some great lakes. Christoph, your thoughts? Citizens of the world, be aware of Bitcoin. <laughs> and remember, gas stations should accept Bitcoin. Yeah, gas stations. All right, no exit question on that. Let's see if we have any questions and answers. I want to I say one thing about Wisconsin being invisible largely. <laughs> you know, there's tons of great talent that comes out of Wisconsin, but guess what? They don't come back. They leave, they go do talented things, and they don't come back. Uh, you know, well, some of them don't. Uh, Chris Farley them. comes to mind. Jeremy Scahill comes to mind. There's, there's, there's dozens. But you know what? The house you in the what? prairie? Wisconsin, <laughs> Wisconsin is the, the badger state. And if ever a state should embrace a currency, it should oh, be honey. Wisconsin embracing oh. Bitcoin. And we should maybe give... <laughs> we should maybe give Bucky Badger a new costume that's more Honey Badger-like and slap an orange... You know, maybe the UW Madison could change their colors to orange and white instead of red and white. And uh, maybe we can make this a big thing, right? The Badger State, the Honey Badger of currencies. Let's. I see something going on here. And not, that that I didn't mean uh, for that to be offensive. I mean, I, I'm in Florida. I'm pretty sure Florida's uh, part, at least partially responsible for George W. Bush and all of the stuff that came after that. So sorry, I couldn't vote then. But <laughs> I think Lassie was set in Wisconsin, wasn't it? <laughs> I can't. It was. It looked like one of those sort of, you know. Well, we'll have the guy from England explain the Midwest to us. <laughs> Laverne and Shirley. Wayne's yep. World had an awesome scene at a, a Alice Cooper co concert in in Milwaukee. Come on! Oh yeah, <laughs> Milwaukee from the Alg the Algonquin. It means a uh, great land or something, promised land. I remember that. Moving on to questions, we're gonna give this one to Christoph Atlas. How is Dark Wallet different than any other Tumblr? That's, good. That's a good question. Um, if you still don't understand it by the end of this answer, check out an article that I wrote called um, The First Three Generations of Mixers, Bitcoin Mixers. So the first mixers that we had for Bitcoin were kind of like the centralized approach to Bitcoin mixing. You send someone your Bitcoins, they do something mixy with it, and then they send some other Bitcoins back to you. And you hope that they did it right. You hope that they don't steal the Bitcoins before they send it back to you. You hope that they don't you know, write down a little record of, of where the Bitcoins uh, came and went from. You hope that it's not actually the FBI that's running the service. Um, so those are all things that you hope about those that first generation of mixers. And Dark Wallet is in the spirit of the second generation where we are decentralizing mixing, making it a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, service so that a bunch of people who are Dark Wallet users will get, to, you know, their, their software will collaborate to mix one am amongst each other. Uh, there's even a feature in Dark Wallet where you can kind of, you can allow your coins to be passively mixed in the background even when you're not trying to send to other people. They can kind of just continue to be mixed every once in a while and help out and give more anonymity to the other people that are trying to mix. So it's, it's a really cool uh, piece of software from that vantage point. And the last thing that they're going to try to do, I believe, with Dark Wallet, this is also that's uh, you know analogous uh, what's going on with Dark Coin, which is an altcoin, is that they want to make it a uh, blind mixing as well, so that uh, not only can bitcoins not be stolen in the process of mixing, which is what you get when you do this kind of coin join operation, but um, also no one knows other than yourself where the coins are going to when once they go into the mixer. You don't have to tell anyone. Right now, the way it works is you, there has to be some piece of software that sort of orchestrates the coin join, and that piece of software does you know the relationship between the input and the output um, addresses. And eventually, they want to make that blind, so it's that's going to really perfect it from a mixing standpoint. And I believe that the soft, the way that they've designed the software is to make it compatible with that uh, that future 
in the, the future. So um, it's a really important development, and it's, it's going to take uh, mixing to the next level. All right, related question. How can we tip the Dark Wallet project? I believe if you go to darkwallet.is, um, I'm sure they have tip addresses there. If you actually download Dark Wallet as well, there, um, if you go into the contacts for Dark Wallet, they pre-programmed into the contacts is one for the the Dark Wallet team. So you can actually tip them through Dark Wallet if you want. Very cool. This uh, next question is more of a comment, but uh, this is one of our funniest commenters, Wrestling Jesus, and he writes, Where's my guy Derek J at? I mean, Megan is a total babe and all, but Derek is my eye candy. Roar! I thought that was funny. Well, we're actually working on taking over the Bitcoin group, so that's why Paige is here. It's a slow coup, but... <laughs> It's ladies' night on Bitcoin night group, but it, it's only a two out of six or two out of five takeover so far. So, <laughs> Next question. So we agree the currency is cool and has enabled the entrepreneurs to innovate, but the action on the blockchain is with Ethereum. What's going on? Anyone have any idea why all the action on the blockchain is with Ethereum? Um, I don't That's see that there's any action with Ethereum because they don't really have a product out yet. It does seem like everyone mentions it, though, when they think, what's the cool new thing? Oh, you mean Ethereum. I guess it's just the smart contracts idea. They seem to be the first ones really working on smart contracts, though we haven't seen the final project yet. Um, people are just excited about contracts, right? Isn't that what we're seeing? Like, it's the next thing we want to replace. Yeah, every, everyone's, everyone's bored of Bitcoin now, and they just want Bitcoin 2.0. Like, this is cool. This is actually a condition called neophilia which is like the constant need for new things. Like you always need something like to satisfy your kind of mind candy. And it's, I call it, I call I have another term, I call it uh, mental obesity, where people just gobble up whatever's in front of them. I just need something to think about. I need something to fantasize and daydream about. Uh, no, Ethereum haven't launched anything yet. It's been a whole lot of our marketing and it's still a lot of question marks. I'm not critical of anything. Like, don't get me wrong, I really love the idea. It's just that there's there's big question marks over centralization of hashing power into such a large uh, network, and also like how it's going to work in practice. You can't start putting exchanges on there. This isn't going to be the bandwidth. Um, so yeah, the, the you know still a lot of questions. Seems very related to our next question, which is also about Ethereum. Ex energy regulator Chris Cook discussed on the Kaiser report the possibility of building a gas coin on Ethereum. Any views on how this might play out? Anyone catch the Kaiser Report show? I didn't see the show or, or hear that interview, but I think a lot of... What, I'm a fan of Ethereum from day one, um, just as a, as a caveat, but I have been seeing more and more like institutional interest, let's say, in Ethereum, and that gives me some pause. Uh, it, I think it's good... In, in general, you know, I, I, I'm always going to be somewhat skeptical of that, but I think it's good in general that some, you know, innovative minds in these institutions are thinking forward about, you know, how their business model can evolve when this automation and uh, decentralized blockchain tech really takes off, which Ethereum is promising, um, but not here yet, you know. So that, it, it does give me pause, though, that I'm hearing most of the interest, most of the I'm hearing a lot of um, like salivating comments from you know large large industries and institutions that we're all familiar with and hoping I think in large part to use Bitcoin to get away from. So that's that's a, that'll be interesting to watch. Um, again, if it's not evil, then it's great. But if it's anything like what we've been experiencing with the you know, the doctrine of corporate personhood model that we've had for about a thousand years, we're going to have issues. So let's all keep an eye on that. I, I'm rooting for the Ethereum gang. I think the project's a great idea. But again, you can do anything with a software in theory like, like Ethereum. So um, let's be careful. I want to say I haven't seen the show, but it reminds me of an idea I had when I was talking to Andreas about schoolyard coins. We were saying maybe booger coin or... Fart coin could be the next thing. So gas coin might just be another version of fart coin. So I'd watch out for that. Daniel Richardson writes, 
by the way, I watch this every week. I got a few questions, so I donated a little BTC, and I will in the future, too. Keep up the good work and spreading the love. We can beat people's ignorance and cognitive dissonance. X. The kiss is for Megan. Just kidding. Love you all. Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Will somebody Kai. please give Paige some love? Come on. Or will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's what I was will saying. Like, say what about so Paige, you know? Will Come did on. say he had several feminine qualities before the show, so it could be people are just picking he's, up on that. lovely men. Drifting towards Will. <laughs> Next question. Anyone working on a decentralized version of Yelp? Good no, idea. we're going to... Put on it on Ethereum. <laughs> put it on Ethereum <laughs> along with Gascoin and all the exchanges. Just put it on Ethereum. What we really need is a Yelp coin. Yelp just well, hasn't I, turned into a coin yet. I thought... Um, uh, I think his name's Ryan Charleston. He's working on a project called um, Bitkarati. It, it's I know in the past he had talked about that project being somewhat of an, a Yelp for Bitcoin uh, businesses and people. So um, I, I don't know if he's dropped back into stealth mode as he t makes his next move or something. But um, yeah, there's been attempts at doing a, a Yelp of Bitcoin. Uh, CoinMap is kind of like that. There's other merchant directories that are kind of like that, but um, Bitcoinati seemed like the most promising one to me. So yeah, maybe we should reach out to Ryan and, and get an update. I like the title. It sounds like it has a lot of punching and kicking. Next question: If bitcoins are going to be destroyed to make side change, ch side chains, sorry, and if too many side chains failed and then the Bitcoin could not be recovered. Eventually, everyone holding Bitcoin will have a huge advantage over the sidechain holders. Any thoughts on sidechains? Yeah, I actually saw you check out Peter Todd on Twitter. He was having a bit of a tete-a-tete -tete, um, with uh, someone. It wasn't Adam Back, but it was one of the other sort of sidechain advocates. I forget his name. And it is interesting the, the way this dichotomy is coming about in this community. Yeah, it will have an effect, but it's not going to have a meaningful one. Like, Bitcoin isn't that deflationary. Bitcoin could still function with a few hundred thousand coins in existence. And it's not as if people are going to be destroying their coins forever when they put them into the... Uh, sorry, it's not as if they're going to be putting all of their coins into these sidechains. If the sidechain is ultimately unsuccessful, then they will have lost those coins eventually, but I don't imagine people are going to be that reckless with them. I don't think you're going to see a huge loss if, if it works. Next question. What is the deal with coins being able to change their maximum number of coins? Is this easy to do? Can someone explain the process? Christoph? Uh, yeah, Christoph's one. Sure, I'll take a turn. I'm just, I know Chris could, under, could uh, explain this as well, but... Um, yeah, so coins could do that, but first they would have, you know, you'd have to get some developers to push out software where they changed the number of coins. Um, basically, that would probably just extend the number of blocks that there would be before you run out of uh, rewards. But you first, you'd have to convince all the miners to go along with it. The miners m might. Um, I think that the, it probably for most coins, it's not going to work out. I don't foresee anything like that happening with Bitcoin because. Um, even though miners might like the idea of getting more rewards, they're going to understand that the existing holders of the cryptocurrency do not want to see their stuff devalued. They understand that, that a lot of the value of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies comes from the predictability of the supply of that cryptocurrency. And so if you then uh, renege on that social contract that you have with the existing holders, then they're not going to trust the coin nearly as much anymore. If you're willing to change it once, why not change it again uh, once more in the future? And so I think people, if that happened, people will just dump the coins and that the altcoin will go under the table. Yeah, I, I just want to chime in. Like Whether we're talking about the 2.0 stuff, Ethereum, or altcoins, and you know, the, the nat you know, making them have an inflationary feature, uh, it's you know, it's it's really interesting. I, I I'm seeing more and more and more that the kinds of people who rebuff um, uh, scarcity in money supply in general prior to the emergence of cryptocurrency seem to be embracing that very quality in Bitcoin, uh, like foremost, right? So I'm I don't know. 
maybe this isn't true of the rest of the panel, but I'm seeing more and more people who I would suspect would be like, inflation, we got to have inflation. Deflation, oh, that's really bad, disaster. Uh, but more and more, they're saying that one of their most, their, the clincher feature for them with Bitcoin is its digital scarcity, its proven scarcity. And that's really interesting. I mean, I, I think that's one of the most powerful features here for the, all the applications we've already seen Bitcoin can have. Um, from a sociological standpoint, an economic standpoint, just whatever, a computer science experiment, all those things. So it, it often gets overlooked because we have all these altcoins and most of the 2.0 protocols are talking about issuing in, you know, uh, on an inflationary basis, you know, although small and controlled and transparent and like a fixed issuance inflation, which again is um, much, much better than what we've experienced. But I think let's, you know, more and more lately, I'm like, let's get back to looking at Bitcoin. Let's, let's stop working on all these other things and put all that brain share, mind share back onto Bitcoin, at least somewhat, because we're, we're slogging through the mud here. And I think, I think there are some really beautiful, there's a beautiful blankness about Bitcoin that allows you to build just so many things with it. And we're going to customize it and, and, branch off different um, chains and features on those chains uh, just to test I think is great but um, again we have something that works we have something that has incredible uh, computing might behind it and security um, I don't know I'd like to see more uh, more people share some of their passion back to Bitcoin that they're showing and sharing with the 2.0 protocols the altcoin of the day and things like that which I also value it's just uh, that I think that that com that one feature about Bitcoin that um, that surprises me that more people are embracing is the scarcity thing, which is great because that can change a lot of people's minds yeah. and perceptions about the way they view money, the way they view society. I mean, everything, all the de-risking and all the uh, the false scarcity out there in the economics. I, I mean, I'm going to turn it over to Chris because I know you got a thought. Yeah, but the thing is, well, that Bitcoin needs competition. Otherwise, it'll just be replacing one monster with another. It has to have the competition. And what happened with Dogecoin, I think this is what um, Infinite Radio is referring to, is that they had a bug that was initially, not a bug, but there was a feature in the initial code that they overlooked, and it turned out that it was going to be an inflationary currency and not as they had originally promised. It wasn't a lie or anything. I think it was just a genuine mistake. And Jackson Palmer decided to keep the feature in. And actually a lot of people turn around afterwards and said that's probably a good thing because you probably do want more diversity within the, in the crypto uh, sphere. So um, I think it's important that we have currency competition and we see how all these play out in the open market. It's not up to any one of us to decide. I think it's also important to uh, note that Ethereum and other uh, 2.0 things are doing uh, things that Bitcoin can't do, like uh, specifically the state change storage. Um, like it would be like such a huge thing to add into Bitcoin that it wouldn't be practical to do. And um, also the whole idea. I think it's also interesting to experiment with uh, inflating currencies, especially for these. So uh, they're basically in at Ethereum, they're referring to the Ether kind of as gas, uh, like they're calling it the gasoline of Ethereum. And um, I think... Uh, Feeling my fart coin metaphor again. <laughs> yeah, and so they're, they're, I think what they're doing is an interesting experiment and the whole inflationary currency is not something you can do on a side chain, so you're going to have to do it with an alt coin in the end anyway. So I think having all different possibilities and experiments with this stuff is good. Just to confirm and answer the follow-up question, uh, the coins generally don't change their amount of coins. The Dogecoin situation is a unique situation where they found a bug that makes them inflationary. Generally, if they say there's going to be 21 million coins, it stays 21 million coins unless the miners agree as a group to adopt the new version of the coin. So it's not, it's not exactly a bait and switch where the coins are just going to change their value and suddenly there's millions more of them than you thought. Yeah, actually, Dark Coin went the other way. They had originally a uh, constant uh, amount of coins that would get created each year, and then the community um, demanded that they change that to a fixed amount uh, total in the long run, and so they, they bowed to the community and made that change. And as long as it's a community decision, right, that 
it's generally going to be the right one or at least the decision that the community wants. Let them go their own way with it. Let's you know all be public and be on the same page here. So a couple more questions and comments. Daniel says that Amir Taki is a legend, a man after his own heart. Uh, Silver Miner writes, what do you guys think of the Gox project? Well, I've just been sent this link to savegox.com, and it basically sounds like the uh, customers, at least this group of customers, wants Mt. Gox to be run like Crypto Rush or one of the other exchanges that had trouble then stayed open in an attempt to pay back their customers from the trouble. It's been quite a long time since Gox has gone down. It seems like quite a lot's happened in this. I don't think that people are going to go back to the name Mt. Gox and give them a bunch of money again. Uh, that seems very unlikely. I think you'd be better off selling t-shirts with the Gox name and logo, which might be what the former child star from the Mighty Ducks has in mind. We're not sure. I think it's a far better option for anyone who lost money in Mt. Gox than just the liquidation option or you know the bankruptcy proceedings. So again, this can succeed if you have faithful administrators who actually work hard to, to do this. I mean, you mentioned uh, Crypto Rush. Again, Silk Road 2.0 is doing a fantastic job of repaying customers who got hacked. They're doing that voluntarily. All those people are anonymous. They could run off with money. And they're doing it voluntarily. I mean, well, that's... The, the key difference there is the Silk Road 2.0 got their exchange right back up. They didn't take several months off. Gox, if Gox had any customers that were trying to come back, they're gone now. You'd have to think. I mean, yeah. From what I understand, the the project involves more than just rehabilitating the the brand and the business, and then running an exchange to use profits to pay back the uh, depositors uh, from the failed Gox. It has more to. It, it, it's doing. It's going to do that, but. From what I understand, it's also interested in working with old Gox and Mark Herpelis to get whatever balances are available, the 200,000 Bitcoins that the cat hid or whatever it was, back into the hands of some of these depositors who, who lost a lot of money. So there's a number of facets here. It's not just running the business and using profits to pay back customers. Um, there's other things going on as well. And, you know, I know we like to joke about Brock being uh, young Gordon Bombay on the Mighty Ducks, but he has shown uh, pretty good faithfulness in all of his entrepreneurial ventures that I'm aware of, whether it's in the gaming sector or Bitcoin. So um, I, I'd like to see this have a shot, and I'd like to see people get reconstituted. Just for the record, I would never joke about the Mighty Ducks. If It's not worth winning if you can't win big. Go out there, Bombay. Triple Deke, win one for the team. Let's see the flying V. Next question for Kristoff. It's another exciting anonymous coin question. Dark wallet versus dark coin versus zero cash. Will these altcoins highlight deficiencies in Bitcoin privacy that will impact its adoption at Main Street, Main Street over the long term? Um... I hope so. Uh, I think that Bitcoin privacy needs some more some more love and attention. I certainly do what I can to promote that as an issue, but um, I think that Bitcoin is worth a lot more to the world in the long run if we the more privacy that we can can get out of it. Um, as far as you know, which one is going to prevail? It's you know, it's a it's an interesting race between the three. Um, Dark Wallet actually right now it looks a lot more like Darkcoin. Uh, zero cash is kind of, um, you know, in its own kind of league. They're taking a much different approach to providing financial privacy. So um, I think that zero cash has the better technology in terms of privacy, but we'll see whether they can actually make it work on a practical, a widespread scale. I'm also curious about um, if we'll need to see zero cash sort of adopted by some serious. Um, cryptocurrency operators because some guy that is at John Hopkins University that's a professor full-time and his grad students are not well prepared to run a cryptocurrency. You have to do all this marketing and all this stuff that has nothing to do with academic cryptography. Um, a non-coin is actually trying to do this. What their, their plan basically is they're just going to wait for the zero cash people to finish up their stuff. They're going to copy and paste it into a non-coin and they already have the experience 
with uh, running a cryptocurrency. So I think we'll see something more like that out of the zero cash um, stuff. But it, it'll be an interesting race between the um, the zero cash uh, kind of zero knowledge uh, take on things and the more coin join or coin swap approach to uh, digital privacy. So I like any plan that says we're going to start out with copy and paste. It's a good plan. <laughs> Christoph, I, I have a question. Maybe this will interest the, the first question as kind of a follow-up, too. Uh, so essentially what we're seeing is, you know, wh whatever your an anonymity needs or privacy needs might be that the market is going to provide a solution, and whether or not it's got wide merchant adoption or a big community, there will probably emerge services that will allow you to use these alternative chains to achieve your privacy and then function again in, like, the Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin, ecosystem that's more, you know, got the network behind it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That That's definitely a possibility. I think that there will be, a, at least, you know, in a place like the United States, um, the average gap store is not going to uh, defy the U.S. government and start using some uh, cryptocurrency that's banned by them. Um, but you could see customers who dip in and out of Bitcoin into dark coin or zero coin or use their dark wallet to kind of mix in between their transactions to to make that kind of thing happen. So that's that's certainly a distinct possibility. I think we'll see more we'll see that the customers are able to take more uh, risks in that regard than the businesses are. Very good. Moving on. Next question. I'm not sure how to answer this, so I'll throw it out to the group. How do you think the federal government CFTC or SEC potentially taking jurisdiction over decentralized virtual currencies DVCs and imposing significant reporting obligations will impact domestic growth use of DVCs for commercial purposes anybody well what the what the regulators want is they want to hold someone accountable they want a physical address they can turn up with guns helicopters if necessary and barge in and, and take someone it's not it, it's not that that person has to have been directly at fault what they want is someone to take it out on and so usually like with the telecoms industry they've been going to the ISPs and starting to put levies on the ISPs to make them like report what their users are doing and it's not that the ISP is in any way responsible because they're just a service company they're just laying on the utility um, it's like you know if a terrorist uses a telephone to organize you know a bomb plot um, it's, you know you don't start calling up the telephone company and, and asking them to you know start banning telephones or anything like that so I think there's a I think there's a bit of a category error the reason why the federal government started calling Bitcoin property is just for convenience purposes it was intellectually dishonest because they weren't looking at the outcome of, of, the, of the value transfer they were trying to be pedantic and they were looking at the actual code and they were going well I think you're fine this is just property and it's just a, it's just a convenience thing they'll say whatever they have to say to, to continue their power very good and our last question well well, someone says, how many times will China ban Bitcoin in 2014? I think we're pretty tired of that already, right? <laughs> 11 more times. 11 more times. Very good. We'll put that at the, at the top for 11. We have another question. When is the Bitcoin job fair again? Anybody? Yeah. I think it's this weekend. Tomorrow. 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 I'll be there, so come say hi to me. <laughs> and the last question, three kisses for Paige. So there we go. <laughs> way more than one. That's three. And Yay! now we're looking for <laughs> predictions, story of the week, or final thought. Chris J, are you ready with a prediction, a story of the week, or a final thought? So I've been thinking a lot recently about the intergenerational disparity, and this came up in the Feathercoin meeting the other day when one of our developers turned around and said that his dad sort of doesn't think he does anything for a living because he spends all of his time staring at a computer. And I, I'm thinking of ideas uh, for my own show, so if you have any ideas of what you want me to do for a show, please tweet me at Mr. Chris Ellis. I'd just like to read something else that came up from one of our developers um, on the Feathercoin group as well, and this was a, a well, it wasn't supposed to be a poem, but it, it sounded very poetic to me, and it's by one of our users, he's called Kevlar on the forum, or Travis Sorbo um, is his real name, and I just want to read this out because I want to really inspire people to get into the coding. There are far too many marketers and salespeople in this industry. We need more 
people, not necessarily that want to be coding day to day, but at least understand the code and understand the underlying technology such that they could educate and inspire other people to, to get into it. So I'm just going to read this out, if you don't mind, one sec. So let's talk about the Merkle tree. So the Merkle tree is named after Ralph Merkle, and it's the part of the Bitcoin blockchain that allows us to prove the verifiability of the transactions. So this is what he said. Merkle trees form their own identity for the expression of a sequence of data. They are pure and they do not allow for the absence of data. They are either verifiable or they are not Merkle trees. The Merkle tree's identity is its structure. By walking the tree, you give birth to a pattern, a pattern that is unique to that tree. No other tree may be called by that name. The identity is computable anywhere in the universe, always unchanging. It's unaffected by everything that plagues us. It's timeless or perhaps without time, because it exists only as long as you imagine it to. Its true length is measured in electrons, coursing through a series of bridges and gates, which change the state of the gates to represent its walk through the hashing algorithm sequence. It is an emergent process of a series of emergent processes, each dependent upon the prior succession of a million statistically unlikely events, which collapse into a singularity difficult to walk the path of uniqueness. And I just think, that's really beautiful. It's really elo eloquent. And and the thing is, the thing the thing about Bitcoin is that it wasn't just an innovation of technology. In fact, it, it, virtually nothing in in the Bitcoin paper, if you go read it, is is original to Satoshi Nakamoto. It's more an innovation of values than anything else. And all he did was take existing technologies. That, that were already well established, like RSA encryption, like from the 70s, the Merkle tree, which I think like uh, Merkle so were like from the late 90s, and then of course Hash Cash, which was the 2000s. He just took existing tools and just bake them into a cocktail. And it's inspiring because it means that if you go from, you learn how to code in Python or Code Academy, or you start to hang out on GitHub and you start to see some of these decision-making processes, then you can maybe get involved as well and, and, and make an invention of your own. So I think it's important just because we can't have all of these decisions in the future being made by a group of, you know, let's face it, a bunch of white middle class guys sitting in their bedroom because that's what the demographic mostly is. Because these are the new legislators, these are the people that are writing the laws and we are baking our values into, the, into this code and it's becoming the new future experience that you're going to have. So I think it's important that we get more diversity into the coding. Paige Peterson. Actually, so I was going to uh, bring up the, the job fair uh, as my final thought. So I'll be there um, actually uh, with, with a booth for MadeSafe to actually sort of, um, to kind of go off what Chris was saying, to, uh, to help incentivize developers and designers and stuff to possibly work for themselves and make their own applications. Um, so there's this Bitcoin job fair where there's a lot of, companies that are Bitcoin based that are looking to hire people to work for them but there's also this option of being able to work for yourself and take advantage of all of this amazing new technology that's um, has come about in the past few years to make your own new applications new um, new method of um, building already existing applications and decentralizing them yourself Megan Lords. So I kind of have a sad story of the week. Um, as some of you know, there was some massive flooding in Pensacola uh, the past couple of days uh, due to a really severe storm that none of us were expecting. So a lot of homeless camps got flooded, and the county jail actually had a gas explosion that killed two people and injured several others, even though there were reports of gas, you know, the smell of gas throughout the day, and no one really did anything about it. Um, so basically, I, I'm just saying keep these people in your thoughts. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure damage. Uh, it's very, it's still pretty difficult to get around. A lot of people's cars got flooded and their homes got flooded. And then there's a, a ton, a huge displaced homeless population too. So keep, you know, Sean's outpost in your thoughts and prayers and the other people affected down here. Christoph, Atlas. Um, I think that May 1st, which is um, so-called May Day, for me is a pretty useless holiday. I'm not a huge fan of socialism, but um, 
for me, from now on, it's going to be Dark Day. Um, I love the developments in Dark Wallet and Dark Market, and I'm inspired by the actions of these individuals, and I have a, a good deal of hope for the future in terms of economic freedom based on the continued actions of the people that support them and the people that are building these projects. Will Pangman. Uh, story of the week for me is um, the MIT Bitcoin Club's expo on, on Saturday and the news uh, coming in the fall, all the students, all the undergrad students at MIT with $100 worth of Bitcoin in their pockets to start the year. So um, please, if you're interested in some of the um, events going on in Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, this weekend, May 3rd, uh, you can register on their website. I think it's mitbitcoinclub.org, mitbitcoinexpo.org. I'm going to tweet the uh, YouTube link for the live stream in uh, the Bitcoin MKE feed and my, my personal uh, Twitter account, Wilwaki, at Wilwaki. So um, check out the, the MIT Bitcoin Expo this weekend and, uh, and support, support to all these college groups. There's a, there's a bunch of them popping up right now, so keep an eye out. Excellent. Very good. Prediction. The news out of Talladega Speedway this weekend will be nothing but Dogecoin, Dogecoin, Dogecoin as Josh Wise and his Doge car speed their way to almost certain victory. They have much wow behind them and their car is very fast. Dogecoin for the win. We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye.